in patients here at Nazareth Home, and I see some familiar faces. Some of you have been with us throughout our community education series this year. I see some new faces, familiar faces. Uh, regardless, we're so glad to have you here this afternoon and, and, and welcome you. Um, we're also very happy to have um, Palatus Health Partners with us. We've enjoyed a really great working relationship um, with them for the last couple of years, and Dr. Dustin Dillon will be presenting to us here in uh, just a few minutes. For those of you who may not have um, uh, a good familiarity with Nazareth Home, we do have two campuses here in Louisville. We've been here on this campus since 1976, and then we have um, a big sprawling campus in the Clifton neighborhood um, as well. And we offer a full spectrum of care, helping seniors who are in transition and who are no longer able to live at home. Um, we're proud to say that we're an award-winning organization. Um, Person-centered care is, is our focus, and really it's about helping residents find freedom, fulfillment, and explore the joy of living, um, get back to living. We bring comfort and peace also to family members who are entrusting their loved ones um, to our care, and we take that, of course, very, uh, very seriously here. Uh, the Community Ed Series is a new offering. Uh, we developed this in January as a way to be a thoughtful friend to the community. Um, it's really designed for family members who have loved ones in care with us, and also for the general public um, as a way to educate about aging and wellness. We could not do what we do without the strong connections that we have in the outside community with other organizations. Um, there's others who bring a particular expertise in the field of aging, and Palatus Health Partners is one of those such organizations. Um, with Palatus, we developed a really unique program. It was in the fall of 21, uh, right after I started here working for Nazareth Home. Um, and it's called HELP, Helping Embrace Life Decisions. And what this program is, is it really brings a multidisciplinary team together of geriatric experts um, to help people who are living with uh, chronic or advanced, you know, conditions. Um, we're getting ready to roll this program out now two years later. We, we just had it here at our Highlands campus. We're gearing up to roll this out at our Clifton campus in November of this year. So that will be an additional service offering to those family members who have loved ones at Clifton. And uh, we're really excited about that. In your folders, your info packets that you grabbed when you came in, um, you will notice that there is a brochure in there for the health program if you want to dive in and learn a little bit more about that. Um, also in the packet, I want to just go over a few housekeeping items. You'll see a flyer in there for next month's presenter. We will be welcoming uh, UofL's Trainer Institute here to talk about geriatric assessments. So be sure and sign up for that if you're interested. And you will also find on the blue sheet of paper, there is a survey. So at the end of today's session, if you can just take a few minutes, give us a little feedback. We read every one of those that we get each month, and that's how we develop this programming and select the topics um, that are of interest to you. So take a few minutes, and uh, my friend and colleague Susan will be at the doors, and she'll collect those on your way out. Um, Okay, enough, enough of my talking, but I want to quickly introduce um, Dr. Dustin Dillon, who we're excited to have today. Uh, Dr. Dillon is a palliative care physician, board certified in hospice and palliative medicine, pediatrics, and has a hospice medical director <coughs> certification. He attended the University of Louisville School of Medicine and completed his residency and fellowship training at Northwestern in Chicago, fun city. He now serves as Medical Director of Palliative Care Services for Hospice Health and Palliative, I'm sorry, Palliative Health Partners in Louisville, and uh, we want to welcome him. Thanks, Dr. Dillon. Can you all hear me? Yep, that works. Okay, perfect. Uh, thank you, Melissa, and thanks for having me today. Um, 
My uh, goal is really to talk and dive in a little bit to what palliative care is and what it isn't, <clears throat> but also talk about what hospice care is and also what it is not. Um, I think there are so many misconceptions uh, out in the community about what our team does, what I do, um, and there's even sometimes even more misconceptions in the medical community. So even when I speak with other physicians or team members, they'll say palliative care, like what, what is that all about? So my goal today is really to give you all kind of a broad overview of types of patients that we see, but also my hope is that when you leave today, you say, oh, you know what, like palliative care is actually there if you get nothing else, an extra layer of support for patients and families that are facing some sort of serious medical problem. Uh, I always tell people like we are here to help. So these are my objectives, which we'll go through. And then at the end, we'll talk a little bit about advanced care planning, um, big terms and big words that actually just mean planning ahead for your health, um, but we can't call it something nice and simple. We have to say advanced care planning and it makes us seem uh, more sophisticated. So I work for Hospice Health, um, which most people know is a very, very large uh, nonprofit hospice organization. Over the years, we have definitely expanded to uh, providing more than just hospice. Um, and so we are providing a range of different services now, one of which is palliative care. And so uh, on my slides, you may see um, this Palatus Health Partners logo. So Palatus Health Partners is the business line of uh, hospice health that provides palliative care services. So if you see like hospice, palatus, kind of sounds the same, right? Um, so our hospice health is the overall organization, and then palatus health partners is our palliative care business. Um, so just wanted to kind of set the stage for that so that you know what you're looking at. So when we talk about palliative care as being an extra layer of support for patients with some sort of serious or chronic medical illness, um, over the last, I would say, five years, this idea of palliative care has grown and grown and grown. Not just in the community, but also in the hospitals, in facilities such as Nazareth Home, um, anywhere where people kind of call home. And so the reason that that is, is because if you look, our uh, uh, patients and all of our folks that live in the United States the overall population is getting older. And as we age, we develop more chronic medical conditions. So if you look here, well that went ahead without me. Um, if you look here, 12% of US adults have five or more chronic conditions. That's a lot, right? This could be diabetes, heart failure, COPD, dementia, cancers, uh, atrial fibrillation, all of the above. And so when I see patients a lot of times, it's not because they have one chronic or serious medical illness, it's actually that they have three, four, seven, and all of that is greatly affecting their quality of life, right? So the hardest thing I think for most patients as they get older or as they deal with or face chronic or serious medical illnesses is that their body doesn't allow them to do what they used to be able to do. People tell me that all the time. You know, I say, Dustin, I can deal with the pain. I can deal with the shortness of breath, although I would like to be able to breathe easier. But the thing that bothers me more than anything is that I used to be able to get up and walk out, get my mail, and come right back in without even thinking about it. And now, that's really, really, really hard for me to do because my hip hurts so bad, or I get really, really, really short of breath. Um, and so when we think about palliative care and why there is uh, a growing kind of field of palliative care in the medical world, it's because folks are getting older. And as we age, we develop more chronic or serious medical problems that affect our quality of life. And if you're anything like me, I really enjoy living. And part of living is having a good quality of life. And so hopefully as we dive into palliative care, we'll talk more about quality of life and what that actually means. So, uh, think about going to the ER or going to the hospital and getting admitted. I laugh and tell people all the time, 
I get paid to go to a hospital and I still don't want to be there, right? They're just not great places to be unless you absolutely have to be there. But again, the more chronic medical illnesses or serious medical problems that one has, the more likely it is that you will end up in the emergency room or in the hospital. So look here, uh, for the folks that had, the percentage of patients that had at least one ER visit, if they had five or more medical problems, was 32%. So one out of three people that have five or more medical conditions at least had one ER visit in a year. And ER visits, you know, I used to think this when I was in training. I was like, well, how bad can it be to go to the ER? Because um, I was working on the other side of it. So uh, a couple of years ago, I had to have my gallbladder taken out and I had to go to the ER because I was having abdominal pain. So I waltz in and I thought, boy, I'm really gonna get the doctor treatment. Not true. Uh, so I walk in and I tell them, I say, well, I'm hurting really, really bad. And they, the, the lady at the front desk, she laughed. She said, well, you look pretty good to me. And I said, well, I don't feel pretty good. Um, and so she said, well, stand over there and we'll get, get with you. And that was at about 1 p.m. Uh, at 9.45 p.m., I was finally going back to the room. And so, right, going to the ER is not a walk in the park, right? It's not you're in, you're out, you're there for hours, it's uncomfortable, there's people coughing everywhere, you're trying to stay, uh, trying to stay healthy, so ER visits are a really big deal. Getting admitted to the hospital is even more of a big deal, right? Your whole life has been disrupted, you're, you can't take care of your dog at home, uh, you're worried about your plants dying. Uh, your friends are supposed to be coming over for dinner on Wednesday, and I'm the one that's supposed to be cooking. I've got to be home. I have a hair appointment. I never understood that hair appointments were really, really important, but I understand they're really, really important now. So we got to make sure folks don't miss any of their hair appointments because they're in the hospital. And so the aim of palliative care is really to think, how do we best keep folks out of the hospital? Not because going to the hospital is bad, but because most people don't want to be in the hospital and they don't have to. So again, I'm just kind of laying the groundwork of why palliative care um, is important. So if you think about the impact of uh, aging and having more chronic conditions, um, you spend more time in the hospital, which most people don't want. They want to spend more time at home. Um, think about all the medicines folks end up on, or maybe that you're on. Um, it is very easy to uh, start eating pills more than you eat food. And I, uh, I think when I was in training, I didn't quite grasp that until I really kind of um, became a palliative care physician. You know, I would go out and I would see somebody and I would say, well, can I see a list of your medications? And usually there was somebody that would laugh, which I was like, that's always a bad sign if somebody laughs when you ask to see a list of their medical conditions, because. They would, it was almost like a scroll, and they would pull it out, and I was like, oh boy. And so I was like, do you take all of these? And they say, yeah. And I say, okay, are you taking anything else? And they'll say, well, yeah. And there's always, I don't know if you all have this, there's a Walmart sack that's usually in a bedroom somewhere that has a bunch of bottles of pills that you just save just in case. And so normally they'll bring that out, and they'll say, are you taking this? And they'll say, I don't actually know. So it is not uncommon for us to see patients that are on 20, 25, 30 medications. Um, and it's not that those medications are inappropriate, it may be very, very appropriate, but if you think about cost of medications, they're not cheap. And it always blows my mind, you know, I was talking to a lady the other day and um, uh, we had prescribed something for her and she said out of pocket cost per month, it was like $275. She said, I don't, I don't have $275 makes total sense, like we have to come up with an alternative plan. So again, the impact of getting older, having more chronic serious medical illnesses, or just being ill in general, kind of drives up medication utilization, um, and also, I think I keep hitting something. Does this move forward for me? It's still down. Oh, yeah, it's, it's telling me to hurry up, okay. Um, I'm going to hear the, the Oscar music, you know, start playing, and like, get off the stage. Um, and so again, more medications, higher out-of-pocket costs for healthcare. So when uh, 
when somebody is seriously ill or a family member is seriously ill, like what do those uh, patients, what do they experience in the health care world? Some of you all may have experienced this or maybe you have a loved one that has experienced it or a friend, right? I hear this over and over and over. I just feel like nobody is telling us what's going on. It's usually the doctors, I can say that, because I am one. Doctors are uh, typically not great at communication. I see some heads nodding, so I know that that is the case, okay? So people will say, we just feel like we don't know what's going on. So overall, the communication is poor. Um, there's a higher burden of pain and symptoms. We talked about symptom management and symptoms as being a decreased quality of life. So think about having more pain, shortness of breath, nausea, vomiting, depression, insomnia. Does anybody in here have trouble sleeping or maybe it's just me? Yeah, yeah, everybody's raising their hand, right? Not being able to sleep absolutely will decrease your quality of life. And so, again, having more illnesses, uh, you have a higher burden of symptoms, low satisfaction. Again, if you feel like people are not talking to you or you don't know what's going on and you feel really, really cruddy, you're probably not going to be overly satisfied with your health care or the health care that you're receiving, even if somebody's doing just a stellar job because you just don't feel good. And then lastly, again, a lot of people just see treatment or medical interventions that are not aligned with their preferences. And so what do I mean by that? That's, well, uh, let's say it's a loved one and mom has dementia and there's a son and daughter there. And when, when they're ill, they're in the hospital, all of a sudden things just start happening. Procedures, scopes, breathing machines. And you know, sometimes you get on this medical merry-go-round and once the medical merry-go-round gets going, it's really hard to get off of that. And so we hear that all the time. It's like, Ooh, I don't know actually if mom would have wanted that. I remember her saying something about machines. And so again, as we think about palliative care and what that offers, keep that in mind. And again, 60% of patients as they get older and when they're seriously ill end up dying in hospitals, okay? Which is, again, not a bad thing. Most people think of like being in a hospital is like, okay, I'm pretty sick. But what do most patients or, uh, that have serious illness in their families, what do they actually want? These are actually studies that have been done. Um, I wish I could have done a study and gotten published for this, because to me this seems pretty uh, intuitive. Um, but they say they want time with their medical team. We want to be able to sit down with my doctor, my nurse, the social worker, the chaplain, uh, the hospital team, and talk about what is most important to me, how I'm actually feeling, what can we do as far as next steps, what is it that I need to expect, all these things, so time with the medical team. They want really, really good communication, so effective communication. Uh, and so that may be, I want to know about my prognosis, right? So let's say someone has advanced cancer and we think we are in the final months of life. Most people will say, I really, really would like to know that because I want to be able to make plans or I want to be able to steer my ship however I want to steer it and not have somebody else steer the ship based on what they think is best for me. And people cannot make decisions for themselves if they don't know how much time they have or their prognosis. Uh, they want good symptom control. If you're like me, I don't like pain. I'm a typical man, so uh, if any of you other gentlemen in here, right, if we have a cold, like we just don't do well. Um, I remember the first time I got married, uh, I had a cold, and I remember laying in bed in Chicago, and I was calling my wife, I said, Christine, she said, what? I said, oh, I'm just, I feel so bad. She said, you, you have a cold? And I said, I know. I said, but I'm going to need you to make me some soup. And she very quickly told me that I, uh, she was not my mother, um, and that I could make my own soup. So we set those expectations really, really, really early on. Um, but, right, uh, we don't want pain. We don't want to have high symptoms. And again, we want to make sure all of our care is coordinated, like make things as smooth as possible. When we have to transition from the hospital to home or from home to skilled rehab, we want those transitions to be smooth. 
And then again, look at that bottle. This was from a study. They asked folks that had serious medical illnesses, they said, where do you want to die? And 70% of people said, I want to be at home. I want to be with the people that love me. And so again, think about 60% of people die in the hospital, but 70% of people want to die wherever they call home. Whether it's actually a home or the facility they live in, they want to die around people that love them and that they love. So all of this really, really matters, right? Because as people get older, they uh, have more serious illnesses, they won't have a higher disease burden, a lower quality of life. But to me, I always tell people like palliative care um, is really, really personal for me. Okay, so why does this really matter? This all matters because we all have people that we love, that we cherish, that we're close to, whether it's a spouse, a son, and a daughter, a friend that lives across the road. And when we see them hurting or we see them suffering, we want to make sure that they're getting all the support that they need. Okay? So this is uh, my sister, um, and so if you think about your one person in the world, right, that you're closest with more than anyone, that you can tell anything to, my sister was it for me. And so uh, she got diagnosed with breast cancer when she was 40, first mammogram, and then uh, she died three years ago. And so her whole journey, right, she had lots of pain, uh, lots of trouble breathing, lots of depression, just right? And she did not have good palliative care support. Uh, she lived in a different area of the country, and so that area of the country just did not have palliative care support that could provide that extra support for her because she was seriously ill. So when I think about the patients in the community that we're able to serve, I always think of her because I wish she would have had that, right? She, she had me from afar, and hopefully I did a pretty good job. I think she would say I did. Um, but this, to me, is very, very personal when we think about taking care of folks in the serious ill space. Um, and I'm sure if you think right now, think of all those people that you're closest to, you want the best for them. Um, and I'm sure there are people that also want the best for you all. And that's what life is all about, is these connections. So let's talk about what palliative, when you see the word palliative, there's a couple of different focuses. Um, and so there's a curative focus and then there's a palliative focus. These are not necessarily mutually exclusive, okay? So a lot of people, this is where the first thing all doctors get wrong mostly, right? They say, well, if our goal is to cure or if our goal is to modify the disease, you can't receive palliative care at the same time. And I'll say, no, 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 no. Curative focus here is very physician directed, right? The physician comes in or the provider comes in and they say, this is what we're seeing and this is what we're gonna do. And most of the time as the patient, you shake your head and you say, okay, that sounds good. Um, opposed to that is the palliative focus, which is very patient directed. So I love what you said earlier, like this is really uh, patient centered care. And that's one of our mottos in Palliative Health Partners. This is you-centered care. So palliative care is really focused on the patient and the family and what is most important to them. Maybe the doctor comes in and says, okay, well, your cancer is worse. We, we're gonna do this next line of chemotherapy because that, right, is a curative focus or a disease modifying focus. Palliative care, we would come in and say, what's most important to you, right? Tell me what you're hoping for. Because for some people, having just a few extra months added onto their life is not the most important thing. Some people it absolutely is. Some people say, well, yeah, I would actually consider doing, you know, this next line of chemotherapy because I'm trying to get to my daughter's wedding, and my daughter's wedding is in two months. So if you tell me I can get an extra few months and I can make it to my daughter's wedding, let's do it. And then palliative care, we would say, if that's the most important thing to you, we support that and we advocate for that. <laughs> Curative focus here focuses on, again, cure and rehabilitation. So it's all about the disease, right? To whereas palliative focus, we're focused not necessarily on the disease so much. We're focused on the symptoms that this, the disease causes. So again, think about the cancer. I'm not an oncologist. I don't get chemotherapy. 
but I take care of a lot of patients with cancers that have really, really, really significant pain because of where the cancer is. Think about somebody with a, a belly cancer, their belly hurts really bad. My job and my goal, my focus is not on the cancer, my goal is on the pain that that patient has to help them feel as good as possible. The care and focus philosophy is all about the length of life, right? It's all about how much time can we give somebody? And again, I'm not saying that time is wrong. I mean, I, listen, I'll take all the years and time I can get. But as people progress in their serious illness, sometimes time becomes less important. Maybe that's not the most important thing. So again, our job is to focus on quality of life. And when I say quality of life, it's however the patient and or the family define it. And I, I say this all the time to medical folks. I or we cannot determine quality of life for you or for you. Only you all can do that, right? My definition of quality of life, what's good enough for me, is going to be completely different than you. And that's probably going to be entirely different from what's okay or good enough for Tracy, okay? And so quality of life is all about us sitting down and saying, where have you been? Where are you now? Where do we think this is going? Like, what do, what do the next few months look like? And let's talk about quality of life. What is the most important thing to you? And again, I love this next part, the unit of care, like who we take care of. Uh, think about in the, the medical world, everything is very patient, patient-focused, right? Which is appropriate. Our world is always patient and family, or patient and friends. It's whoever the patient calls their family, whether it's, blood family or not. Our job is to not just support the patient, but to support their loved ones, because we know that having a serious illness not only affects the patient, it affects everybody around them, right? It affects the family. And so we have to not just support the patient, but to support the entire unit. And again, the last is like the cure focus is very much a medical model. And by that, I mean, it's very medication heavy, procedure heavy. And our model is more holistic. We don't just focus on the physical, we focus on the spiritual aspects of being sick, uh, the emotional aspects, the psychological, right? All of these things go in to how you're feeling and all of those things can be affected by having some sort of serious medical illness. So what is palliative care? So the top uh, line of definition I like, it's specialized medical care for people with a serious illness. Serious illness is an arbitrary term, okay? People always ask me, well, what is, how serious does it have to be? And I was like, well, I guess that depends on who you ask, you know? Um, but think about an illness that causes uh, difficulty with our activities of daily living, like getting our clothes on or walking or being able to take a bath. Like if your disease is bad enough that it's affecting your activities of daily living, I would argue that that is a serious or an advanced disease. But that second uh, definition or that second bullet point is the one I love the most. And that's what I always tell people. Like when I walk in, I'll say, hey, I'm Dustin. I'm a palliative care doctor. You know, people's eyes get really, really big. And I'll say, I see your eyes are big. Tell me what you're thinking. And they'll say, palliative care end of life. I'll say, well, I do sometimes help with end of life, but palliative care is all about living. How can we make life as good as possible? And so that's where we come in and provide an extra layer of support for the patients and families that are facing that serious medical illness. Palliative care can be provided at any point along the patient's disease trajectory. What does that mean? Whether you have five years, two years, five minutes, left to live, palliative care is appropriate for patients with serious illnesses. This has nothing to do with prognosis or time. This is all about quality of life for our patients and families. So it's never too early to have palliative care support. We hear that all the time. They're like, well, I don't know. Mom doesn't seem to be doing very well. Her dementia is getting a little bit worse, but don't you think it's too early for palliative care? And I'm saying, I don't think it's ever too early for palliative care. Sometimes our involvement early on in the disease course may be this much, and over time, 
as the person gets sicker or their quality of life decreases or they have more symptoms, our involvement may become this. And it may kind of do this over time, right? Um, but it's never too early for palliative care support. Um, palliative care allows patients to continue all of their treatment options. So you'll hear this all the time. Well, if I'm, if I'm getting palliative care, I've got to stop my chemo or I've got to stop my blood pressure medicine. Baloney. You don't have to stop any of that. Okay? Our job and my job as a palliative care clinician is really to come along and say, what plan of care makes sense for you? And again, if continuing your 37 meds or your mom's 37 meds, if that makes the most sense, let's do that. Or let's come up with a plan that fits what you're hoping for. And again, this can be provided in the hospital, uh, outpatient, meaning in clinics. Uh, we provide services in the home. And then, as Melissa mentioned, we have here um, at Nazareth, at the Highlands campus, we have the wonderful HELL program at Helping Embrace Life Decisions, to where we can provide an extra support with Dr. McQueen, who's one of my colleagues, um, who's a geriatrician and really provides that specialized, serious or chronic illness care to help manage symptoms and help come up or help define what the goals of care are. And again, it's all about quality of life. So what do we actually do? We help manage symptoms. I do a lot of management of pain and a lot of med management of pain. So that may be using medications like opioids, right? It's getting harder and harder and people are getting more and more scared to take anything other than Tylenol because, right, all you do is you flip on the news all the time and you see, oh my gosh, the opioid epidemic. I always say, well, there's not an epidemic of opioids, there's an epidemic of opioid use disorder, which is an absolute medical diagnosis. And we absolutely see patients that have opioid use disorder, but 99% of my patients have a valid reason for needing opioid therapy. And they'll tell me, they're like, I take Tylenol all the time, it doesn't do anything. And I'll say, well, it seems like you need something a little bit stronger than Tylenol. And I'll say, I agree. And so we do a lot of pain management using opioid therapies, but we also have a lot of other things that we can think about with medications or even what we call non-pharmacologic therapy, which again, um, I never understood the importance of a heating pad um, until the last two years because heating pads are absolutely phenomenal. Um, I remember growing up, my granny would always be like, Dustin, go get me the heating pad. I still recall that, and I was like, why does she use this thing all the time? Now I'm like, the heating pad's wonderful. So are there things that we can use other than medications that help manage patients' pain? Uh, we do a lot of management of anxiety and depression and nausea, all these symptoms that can affect your quality of life. Um, we provide care using an interdisciplinary team. So palliative care is interdisciplinary. And interdisciplinary is that all of our different subspecialties or all of our different disciplines are focused on the patient and family. And so I already mentioned a little bit, but we have doctors, social workers, chaplains, nurse practitioners, nurses. Uh, in our pediatric programs out in the community, for example, we utilize music therapists, art therapists, child life specialists, all of these certain things. Because again, having a serious illness, it's not just the physical, it's the physical, the mental, the emotional, the psychological, all of that. And again, it can be provided together with curative therapy. So you can continue to get anything that's medically available and receive palliative care services at the same time because our job is to help increase quality of life while you're doing that. So what palliative care is not? Okay, so I have this conversation a lot of folks. Uh, number one, top left, it's not just for patients with cancer. You hear that all the time. They're like, well, don't I have to have cancer in order to get palliative care? Absolutely not. So in our uh, palliative care program, we see a significant number of patients with heart failure, COPD, dementia, Parkinson's. So we see just as many patients that don't have cancer as compared to do have cancer. So palliative care is not just for cancer patients. That top right, palliative care is not hospice care. We're gonna talk a little bit about hospice care, but hospice care is for folks at the end of life. So it really is the palliative care philosophy 
provided at the end of life for patients that have six months or less. So I think people use the terms interchangeably a lot, and it gets really confusing. I wish my mother was here, because uh, I'm a palliative care and hospice physician. I've been doing this, what, now for seven years, and she still doesn't know what I do. And she'll say, wait a minute, what's the difference between palliative care and hospice care? And I have to explain this to her all the time, because people use the words interchangeably. So palliative care is not hospice care. That middle left, palliative care is also not sad all the time. There are absolutely some times that are sad, right? It's sad to think about uh, planning ahead. It's sad to think about losing a loved one. It's sad to see people that are suffering with symptoms, but we also get to see just some amazing, amazing patients and families that have almost miraculous turnarounds. Um, I was telling our team this morning, I saw a patient uh, recently uh, in the clinic Outpatient, and she had a really bad COPD and had a lot of stuff going on with her belly, and she had lost like 25 pounds because her, her belly just hurt so bad. And so she made her, her way to us. She heard about us or saw us on something and called and said, "Yeah, absolutely, let's evaluate you." And so we helped come up with a plan to manage her abdominal pain. Well, over the last three months, she's put back on like 16 pounds. She looks fabulous. Her COPD is very well managed. And she said the other day, on Thursday, she said, I finally feel like I'm being heard. She's like, so many times I went to my physician or went to the hospital or to the ER, and she said, I felt like I was shouting, like, I am suffering, but nobody heard me. And so with our team, we were able to come alongside her and come up with a plan that made sense for her. And so again, it's not always said, and again, on the middle right, it's not always kind of end of life in a hospital. Certainly we help with that sometimes, but that's not what it always is. Um, it's also not the, we call these sad hands down in the bottom left. Uh, I don't know, anytime I give a presentation, everybody always throws the sad hands on there. Um, I guess that's fine, but it's not always the sad hands. I don't even know what that's supposed to represent, but everybody always kind of sees that. And the, the bottom right, what's really important too, is that it's not always like wonderful and great and happy, surrounded by families that everybody is smiling and laughing and reflecting on life. It's not always that either. We see some of the most heart-wrenching um, situations that I've ever seen. Like if you were writing a book, right, you wouldn't be able to make any of this up. Like you couldn't write the story that some patients and families go through. Um, and so sometimes it is horribly sad. So these are just all of our objectives that we focus on um, when we're seeing patients. So again, we focus on symptoms and medication management. We focus on education for patients and families to say, this is what's going on with your disease. This is what I expect over the next weeks or months. Um, we discuss goals of care. And everybody's like, what is that? It's, it's truly just plans for the future. What's most important? If your breathing were to get worse, what would you tell us then? If we were talking about putting you on a breathing machine, but we knew or we really, really thought that you were not going to come off that breathing machine, what would you tell us then? Making those plans in advance or advanced care planning is really, really important because most of you all probably have pretty uh, strong feelings uh, or desires about how you would want your health care to go. At least I do. And so planning ahead for that and having that down on a document, it makes it so much easier for the person that may be making medical decisions on your behalf. We also get patients connected with the appropriate uh, community resources. You know, again, when it rains, it pours. I feel like when your health starts failing, it seems like everything else comes along with it. Uh, so many of our families out in the community lack good access to good nutrition, right? So can we get them plugged in to a specific community resource to make sure that they provide in-home meals? Uh, we focus on completion of advanced directives. So advanced directives are things like living wills or do not necessitate forms. These are all these documents that kind of go uh, along with advanced care planning. It's like I am communicating my wishes and I'm putting my wishes down on paper so that if I ever can't speak for myself, 
not only am I going to have somebody that can speak for me, but they're also going to be able to say, this is what this person or my mom has already told us. She said, absolutely do not put a beam in Cuba. Right? I think having that down on paper, it has the, the person that's making medical decisions uh, for their loved one, makes it so much easier. It really is a gift. These are just common triggers for palliative care consultation. Like why, like again, this goes back to the how, what is a serious illness. And so we, we show people this all the time. Like I always say, if you can circle one of these, palliative care would absolutely be appropriate for the patient. And so just look through those really quickly, like uncontrolled symptoms, poor prognosis, been to the ER, couple times in the last year and been hospitalized. Maybe the patient's losing weight, but we don't know why. That's a really, really big deal. When patients start losing weight and we don't have a reason for it, that's always something uh, that uh, is a red flag for me. So what is, how does that differ from hospice care? So hospice care is a benefit. It's a Medicare benefit, okay? And so for folks that have Medicare, they can elect their hospice Medicare benefit. Hospice care is the delivery of palliative care. It's the delivery of that philosophy, but at the end of life. So hospice care is built around patients that have a prognosis of six months or less. Now that's sometimes really, really, really hard. Um, I'm supposed to be an expert when it comes to prognostication. I think I have prognosticated one patient uh, correctly over the last seven years, right? Because it's, it's impossible. So what we do is we usually talk about time frames. Somebody will say, Doc, how long do I got? That's the question I get over and over and over. And I, I'm never gonna be the one that says, you got four months. Like, how do you come up with four months? Um, and so I may say, well, I think we may be in the weeks to months range, or maybe we're in the months to a couple of years range. So hospice care right off the bat, even though it's at the end of life, for patients that are in their final six months, you can receive hospice care for longer than six months. Because all you have to have is a physician, like myself, that says, based on everything going on with the patient, I think that it's reasonable to think that this patient is in their final six months of life. So we have patients on hospice sometimes for a year, year and a half, because I still think their prognosis is less than six months. We don't penalize people for, uh, for my uh, being incorrect. Um, and so again, the hospice care philosophy, it utilizes that team approach in the home or in a facility or in a hospital. And it's all about helping folks at the end of life and making life as easy as possible and make sure all the symptoms are managed. The hospice core services, again, we provide a wide range of hospice services, all the way from volunteers. We have a wonderful volunteer program. Uh, one of the coolest things we do, uh, our volunteers uh, make, um, uh, what do I call them? They're like love blankets, they're quilts um, for our families a lot of times, and that's just such a sweet, sweet memory for when a patient dies, they get a quilt. Um, many times in our inpatient unit, we'll put those over the patient um, instead of it just being the hospital linens because again, hospital linens feel very, uh, feel very cold to me, right? We want something that celebrates this person's life. Um, so we have a wonderful volunteer group. We have wonderful social workers and chaplains and grief counselors. Think about grief. Grief is our, uh, how we respond to the loss. It's our emotional response to loss. And sometimes that's anticipatory grief. So everybody thinks of grief as being, I lost someone and now I'm grieving. But so many times it's, I, uh, I'm actually the one that's sick and I'm grieving the loss of my independence. Or I'm actually grieving not being able to spend time with my wife. So sometimes we talk about anticipatory grief and our grief counselors are really wonderful at that. And then we provide a range of medical support from nursing to CNAs, wound care, physicians, nurses, all of that good stuff. And that's all part of the hospice benefit. And again, we provide care kind of wherever the patient calls home, whether it's truly at home and uh, assisted living and long-term care. And we also provide hospice in the hospital. So this is a really nice uh, chart 
should always share with folks um, because I think that's really good sense. So if you look at palliative care versus curative or life prolonging care, they can go together and they add up to 100%. Well, over time, our ability to cure diseases or prolong life with certain diseases, our ability to do that uh, goes down just because the disease gets worse. And so as symptoms get worse and as the disease gets worse, we ramp up our palliative care support. And then as patients reach that final six months of life, we start thinking or talking about hospice care. And then what's really nice about the hospice benefit is you'll see bereavement afterward, that time of loss um, that occurs right after somebody loses their loved one. Uh, as part of the hospice benefit, all of our families, if their loved one was in hospice, get 13 months of bereavement services, get grief counseling that's provided through the hospice benefit. So hospice care is a really, really uh, beautiful and wonderful support um, for patients at the end of life. I'm going to skip this because I want uh, to talk really quickly about advanced care planning. But we talked a little bit about advanced care planning which is just talking about what you hope for and want for your future with regards to healthcare, okay? So it's all about planning. If you're like me, sometimes plans change. So that's why advanced care planning is something that's ongoing. The way you feel about your health in the future today may be very different from a week from now, right? Let's say a patient says, oh, I, I feel good now. I, I'll be okay with being put on a ventilator or a breathing machine in an ICU. Especially if they feel like I can come off of that machine and bounce back to where I was before. Like where I'm at in my stage of life and hopefully I'm healthy, right? I would be okay if somebody put me on a ventilator. But if I had advanced cancer, maybe I would feel different about that. So advanced care planning is something that's lifelong. It's something we do over time. And so again, it's all about documenting your wishes and it, everyone at a minimum should have a healthcare surrogate. So who is the person, person that's gonna make decisions for you if you can't? Now, there are surrogacy laws in each state, so like sometimes uh, if you have not named one and you have a spouse, your spouse, it, it goes to them. But I've had a lot of spouses that have actually, I just had one a few months ago, um, she was younger, had advanced cancer, and so I was doing a family meeting with her and her sister and her husband. And so we started talking about who would make decisions for her if she couldn't. And she said, I want it to be my sister. And she said, the reason is, is she was very, felt very strongly about never being put on machines, did not want CPR. In fact, didn't even want to go back to the hospital anymore. And she looked right at her husband and she said, I know you won't be able to make those decisions. And he was very, very tearful and he said, you're right. And so having someone that knows your wishes, but probably even as important as someone who can carry out your wishes, somebody that can speak for you and knows you and what you value, it would be a really, really good healthcare surrogate. And so when we talk about completion of advanced directives, there are many different forms that are advanced directives, and I just put some of them here, but living wills, most patients have a living will. Uh, sometimes it, uh, it's like reading hieroglyphics, like it's really uh, legal sounding, and you're like, I actually don't know what this means. Um, and so, again, these are things that we need to update over time to keep as up to date as possible. Um, healthcare power of attorney, that's how you name your healthcare surrogate. That's very different from a legal power of attorney. Your legal power of attorney can include healthcare, but sometimes people will say, I want this person to manage my finances and I can't, and I want this person to make my medical decisions. Now, sometimes they're the same person, but sometimes they're not. So the legal power of attorney may or may not include healthcare. So if you've named a legal power of attorney and you think, ooh, I wanna make sure they have healthcare decision-making rights too, just look at what is written underneath there. Most of the time it does, but you may want somebody different as the healthcare surrogate, and that needs to be kind of there are things like EMS DNR forms, so do not resuscitate, which is the form that says, if I die, if my heart stops, I don't want people doing CPR on me. I, I've lived a good life, just let me go. I don't wanna go through that. 
Some people say, absolutely do anything possible that could save my life. And again, that changes over time based on what's most important to the patient and family. This is just our territory um, where we provide services um, for Palace Health Partners and Hospice Health. So we have a big, wide range of uh, services through all of these different counties, and I get the joy of driving all over the place uh, to see folks. And if you all ever have uh, more questions or want more information, you can always just visit our Hospice Health website. There's a link to our Palatus program. We have a lot of good information there too about advanced directives and advanced care planning. And the same thing here too um, at Mass Home is you all have so many uh, wonderful resources to be able to think through your health and things like that. And so with that, we have 10 minutes left. So I want to say, what questions do you all have for me? Yes, ma'am. So the question was, uh, for the video, is like, how do you get somebody palliative care support? Who pays for it? Like, really the logistics of making that happen. So we take referrals, both for palliative care and for hospice care, um, from anyone. Okay? So families call in, sometimes physicians send it in. And this is different from the health program here. The health program here uh, has a very defined way of getting referrals in, and the team is wonderful. Um, but it, for folks out in the community, anyone can call in a referral. And we actually, on our website, there's a way to do a referral, and all we need is a name, a number, or who to contact, and then we reach out and we'll talk about what are the next steps. As far as insurance goes, great question. So our palliative care adult program is just like any other subspecialty. So, for example, uh, if your dad goes to see a cardiologist or his PCP, you go see the physician or the nurse practitioner, they see them and they submit a bill to insurance. Insurance says, okay, we're gonna pay this much. Uh, the patient owes $10 or whatever it is. Our program is the same way. So our visits are reimbursed by insurance. There is sometimes a patient responsibility. It may be $10, it may be $3. Um, the ability for a patient to pay though will never ever be a barrier for them to receiving services. We are a large nonprofit. We want to serve patients and families where they are. And so for folks that are like, I can't do 25 extra bucks, we will work with those families and say, let's come up with a plan. Okay, we have financial assistance program. Hospice care is paid for under Medicare. Okay, so Medicare pays the hospice, so they pay us like a daily rate. And then every, uh, with that money, with that uh, little bit of money that they give us every day, and every year it gets a little bit less, right? they just keep chopping it off. Uh, we have to pay for everything that's related to why that person is on hospice. That means paying for the doctors, the nurses, the social workers, the chaplains, the bedside commode, the walker, the hospital bed, the medications. So as you can imagine, right, the hospice Medicare benefit is wonderful because it allows patients to not worry about all the so when a patient comes on the hospice, the only thing that the patient is usually responsible for are the things that are not related to why they're on hospice. And that is usually uh, not a lot of things. Most of the time, the reason that they're on hospice, all the things that they have as far as the diagnosis, they're related. And so we end up covering all those things. So great question. What else? What about patients who are yeah, so uh, the question was, what about patients not on Medicare? Uh, so we have a significant number of those too. So for the palliative care world, commercial plans or Medicare Advantage plans or Medicaid, we submit claims to them just like we would any other insurer, and they have uh, reimbursed us for those palliative care visits. And so again, it's a um, just like if they were going or you were going to see another physician. So again, they go in and normally you have a $20 copay, um, you probably are going to have a $20 copay with us. Uh, for commercial payers or non-Medicare payers in the hospice space, pretty much all payers have a hospice benefit. Most of them really mimic the Medicare hospice.
prosperous benefit, so it doesn't change a lot. There are some little nuances with different plans, but in general, most insurance pay, uh, plans cover uh, hospice support fully. So good question. Yes. Great question. So the, um, all of these are good questions. The question was, is if you're in the program, whether it be powder care or hospice care, do I keep my position? Do I have to give up my position? How does that work? So in palliative care, uh, we are not primary care physicians. I'm a subspecialist. I'm a palliative care doc. And so all of our patients still have their PCP and they go see them. Okay. Um, they still keep all their subspecialists, whether it's the cardiologist or the pulmonologist or the oncologist, they're still seeing them. We, again, are an extra layer of support. We're an extra team to really focus on quality of life and symptom management. In hospice, out in the community, it's a little bit different. Some patients say, you know what, I've known Dr. Smith for 57 years, and just because I'm coming on the hospice, I'm not giving up Dr. Smith now. And so we say, sounds good. And so we would talk with Dr. Smith, and most of the time, Dr. Smith would stay on as the attending, is what we call it, but the, the main doctor that's kind of helping provide the plan of care. Some of our patients say, well, I'm actually gonna choose you all, the hospice team, to be the primary. And so we kind of take over the day-to-day -day management regardless of whether the patient chooses, and it's always the patient choice about who they choose. And we don't have a preference, whatever makes sense for patients. Um, when patients, if they keep their, let's say their PCP or their oncologist, most of those physicians will ask us, they'll say, Dustin, can you all help uh, provide pain and symptom management medications? Can you all kind of be the eyes and ears so that if Mr. Jones is having pain at 3 a.m., I want them to call you because you're much better at managing opioids or managing oxycodone or things like that. So uh, patients absolutely can still keep their doctors or their medical teams in both hospice and palliative care. Um, but in hospice, patients can elect us to be their kind of core primary. That answer your question? Yes. Okay. Yes, ma'am. So the question was, do folks come to us or do we go to them? Both. So we uh, have a wide range of how we provide palliative care. So we do in-home visits. So like a provider, myself, or one of our nurse practitioners, or our social worker, will actually come to the patient's home if they are home limited, okay? Or if they're in a facility, we can come to the facility if the facility um, is okay with us coming in and providing that consultative support. Um, for patients that are still getting out and about and going to clinics, we have different clinic offerings. We have one uh, that's on 17th and Broadway. I actually don't know if 17th and Broadway is that way, but I'm just going to act like it is. Um, and then we also have uh, clinics over on the Baptist uh, Health Louisville campus on Baptist East. And so we're expanding our clinic offerings. What I think has been really, really uh, significant to be able to reach patients and families in a very quick and timely manner has been our use of telehealth. I was the one person, um, when we started our telehealth initiative, I said, this ain't gonna work. I was wrong. I was absolutely wrong. It's hard for me to admit that, but I was wrong. Um, I see so many patients and families because we, I may not be able to get there to see them for three weeks, but I have an hour this afternoon. And so many times our families are like, yeah, we'll take that. Because they have sons, daughters, but most of our patients now, regardless of age, like everybody's pretty used to using their phones now. And so it's a very nice way we send a link and they can click on it. Now in hospice care, again, everything is provided wherever the patient calls home. So our job in hospice is really to make life as easy as possible so that you're not having to get out with our nurses, our social workers, our chaplains our CNAs, our providers, we all come to the home. Yes, sir. Uh, my question, 
I always think of something like this as for older people, you know, older people. Say you have a child that's got some really bad disease or something like that. That's all part of this also, right? All part of it. So uh, I think, you know, as Melissa said, by training, I'm a pediatrician. So I do a lot of pediatric palliative and hospice care. So I take care of a lot of kids with advanced illnesses, and I've taken care of, you know, hundreds of kids that have died at the end of life. And so you're right, it's not necessarily about age. It's all about having a serious or complex or chronic medical illness. And again, there's so much that goes into having a loved one, and it's probably even more so, you know, if it's your child or if it's your grandson or granddaughter. And so just think about how, I don't even want to say disruptive that is to the family, but it flips their world upside down. And so, so many times I meet families on right after they've gotten that terrible brain tumor diagnosis, you know, as their son or daughter, and their world in the span of four hours has changed. They came to the ER because their child was vomiting and they thought, you know, they got a GI bug, right? Give them some medicine and some fluid and we'll be out of here. And then four hours later, it's no, they're vomiting because they have a huge, huge brain tumor. So you're absolutely correct. Our services and the role of palliative care is through the entire spectrum of life. And I was telling Melissa even before, I do prenatal consults a lot of times. So for moms that are carrying kids that have some sort of life-limiting illness and we think time is gonna be really, really short after delivery, I'll meet with them and help come up with a birth plan that makes sense for them. So it's all about patients and families that are facing a serious illness regardless of age. If I end up, go to the hospital emergency and I'm admitted and I've got something, they find something really bad, can I very next day call palliative care and I say, I want you guys to care for me. Is yeah. Does it, it work that way? It does work that way. Most of all, let me think, pretty much all of our hospitals here in the community now have inpatient palliative care teams. So for example, Norton has their own inpatient palliative care team. U of L has their own. Uh, Jewish uses the U of L palliative care team. But yeah, if a patient has a, you know, if somebody went in and got diagnosed with, you know, an advanced cancer, for example, and they're saying, okay, we're going to discharge at home, and you haven't even seen your oncologist yet. You or your spouse or kids, anybody can pick up the phone and say, hey, I think palliative care would be helpful. It's never too soon. And that's the thing I try to stress to folks is like, we want to meet people as early as possible because if we can get to know a patient and family, as time goes on, those really, really hard conversations about, I'm really, really worried we're in the final you know, weeks to months or I'm really worried that dad's not gonna come out of this facility and get back home. That conversation is much easier to have when we've already built trust and rapport with somebody. So I always say it's never too early for palliative care support. And if you all, if anybody you know ever meets one of us and we say it's too early, you pick up the phone and say, I wanna talk to Dustin, because I will go and say it's never too early. Um, so yeah, whenever patients need our support, we wanna be there. Well, thank you all for having me. I know that was a whirlwind of information. I thought I cut it down to like 20 something slides and I still wasn't able to get through it. So uh, I'm long winded. So thank you all so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you.